Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, Bert, I agreed with everything you said. You're more in the, born in the right place, so uh, you live in Maastricht, I presume. So this feels very comfortable, and you live in Maastricht. We're almost in a majority here. <laughs> um, thank you, Luca, for this kind invitation, and always it's a pleasure. You always have such good choices and topics, and uh, your last speaker, or the second to last speaker, is not always the best, but we'll try to make, uh, make due. And thank you, Dagan, for talking about that you're always involved in controversies. Um, I, I sympathize. And, uh, oh, there you are. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. This, when you hang out with certain people from Catalonia, that's what, this is what happens. Okay, here are my conflicts of interest. I could talk about this for hours, but I'm not going to do this. Um, I do have one disclosure I didn't put on here. I drive a white Tesla Model X. It's the anti-Ferrari. Please look it up on the internet, Tesla Model X, and put in Tesla Model X and Ferrari you can come to your own conclusions. Uh, there's, there's plenty of YouTube videos to go around and show this BMOS, which can carry seven people comfortably, and see how well it does against a Ferrari. So that's something to take home, it's homework. Um, okay, so the outline is the same. For those of you who have attended Ashra and couldn't hear me because of audio difficulties, it's really the same presentation. There's so little happening in this field that I, I, you, know, you, you can be out for several years and you're back to where you were before, okay? So it's not, not something to take home and say, I need to do this at home. Don't do this at home, okay? Think, think about it first. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not gonna cover, as you had hoped, mitochondrial replacement therapy for the purpose of avoiding mitochondrial disease. I'm a proponent for, of PGD. Uh, for mitochondrial disease prevention. Uh, I think that should at least be a first step. Uh, sadly, in the United States, probably because of some early papers from, from, from France about 12, 13 years ago, very little mitochondrial replacement, uh, sorry, PGD for mitochondria uh, uh, has done in the, been done in the United States, and I think it's the same in the UK. Uh, but, but, you know, if I see your results from, from Maastricht, um, which, is, which is the town, a town in the size smaller than Oxford, uh, you really wonder why this is. This doesn't make sense. So I think we should really try to communicate better with geneticists and internists and others to make them aware of this potential. Um, I think it's good. We, we, we could debate uh, when to do it. You're a proponent of blastomy biopsy, but then you have to take two bi do biopsies. Um, and early work from, from Belgium in particular showed that that could be potentially difficult for further development. There's one paper also from Belgium from last year where they did trophectoderm biopsy and that patient became pregnant. It's one out of one, of course, the next nine may be negative, but it's one out of one. So I think we should seriously look at that, but I, I'm not gonna talk about that particular aspect. I'm only really gonna talk about the potential effect of doing these type of procedures for fertility purposes. So I'm gonna cover all plasmic transplantation first, which you mentioned. Um, that was done 20 years ago. And while we were doing the experiment, because it was a highly experimental situation, uh, the FDA stopped us after we published our hetoplasmy uh, data. Hetoplasmy of a non-coding region, because we just looked at our hypervariable region of the mitochondrial DNA of offspring and, 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 and found, we, we wanted to see if mitochondria from the donor, from the egg donor, were still present in the offspring. We did this only on eight patients that, that or eight children where the, where the parents allowed us to do this. Uh, there were more children, but there we didn't get permission and two of those eight were positive. Uh, it was non -vari non -vari the hypervariable reason in a non-coding area um, uh, and we had to call it hetoplasmy because that's what you find in the literature. There's no other word for that. It wasn't, my, it wasn't mitochondrial disease hetoplasmy. And that has cost us because the experiment was stopped uh, before we ended it. Uh, we did apply for an FDA permit. Um, 
that's unknown because the FDA in the United States works in mysterious ways. It's very secretive, unlike, unlike what you see in Europe, where it's all very open. There, it's very secretive, so they don't publish their proceedings with individual academic teams or pharmaceutical teams. They just don't publish any of that. You just hear, it, hear about it at the end, when the studies are done and the permits are being given or not. Then you hear about it. Or when, to wanna, or when they publish a, a, a press release, then you'll hear about it, which I, in this case they did. Uh, but we did apply for an FDA permit and had to end it prematurely for reasons unrelated to the, to the particular subject. And I think at the time, and this is of course almost 15 years ago, at the time we felt, and Adegan was involved in that application process, we felt actually that they were very supportive. I think the current FDA isn't like that. There are different people and there's different politicians in charge. And I don't think that currently, in the current climate, uh, it's not going to be possible. But in those days, I think it was possible. It's just unfortunately we had to end that particular uh, application. The second uh, um, uh, group of uh, work I will talk about as much as I can is about autologous injection of act precursor cell mitochondria into the oocyte. So this is the augment procedure done by Overscience. I do not work with Overscience. I'm, I'm not one of their collaborators, and I, I don't have a position there. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm looking at this from an outsider in. I've asked them for data, and most of the data I present comes from Bob Casper in Canada, which is uh, their main clinical site, uh, and he's very generous in supplying the data. Um, and then the last one is, is data that's never been published. This comes from the Ukraine. Very recently, this year, two babies were born after um, uh, cytoplasmic transfer, cytoplasmic donation by exchanging the entire cytoplasm by that from a donor in infertile patients. These were patients in various uh, maternal ages. They were going all the way from 32, 33, up to 43, and there were two babies born, and there's a third ongoing pregnancy, and I'll present that data uh, that was provided to me by the clinic in the Ukraine. Okay. So that's, that's the overviews, overview. So when you alter ovoplasmic function, what would be the purpose? Those are the two that I've described. Mitochondrial replacement therapy for the purpose of avoiding transmission of mitochondrial disease. The other one is infertility. I'm only going to focus on infertility. Delivery, how do you do this? Well, if you think of infertility in the oocyte, you want to make a change in the oocyte, you don't have to do complete mitochondrial replacement, which is invasive, or at least seems to be invasive, in animal models, as well as in the, in the work that's been done in the human. So we, we, we never considered that. So we either considered cytoplasts, these are small, almost blastomere looking uh, drops of cytoplasm from an egg donor that you could use to fuse back to an egg from a patient. Uh, another one is the replacement, which, I, which has been done uh, only in the Ukraine team. And then uh, um, injection is the form that we felt most comfortable with. At the time that we tried these procedures, ICSI had already been established for a few years. And the moment we started, about 50,000 babies had been born worldwide. And it was estimated. This is not a, a figure that I'm entirely sure about. But um, I, we, we do have, uh, have that from, from some speakers um, uh, in the different meetings at that time. So at least it was many, many thousands worldwide. Then what about the position? Well, do you use ovoplasm or cytoplasm from a somatic cell or another cell? Or do you isolate mitochondria? When we did cytoplasmic replacement, we were not convinced, convinced at all that the mitochondria were, were the cause of the failure of cytoplasm. We were not even convinced that it was the failure of cytoplasm. So we didn't feel like isolating mitochondria. Others have looked at that, a particular uh, uh, Dr. Seng from, from Taiwan has published only two abstracts, but claims hundreds of pregnancies by isolating mitochondria from cumulus cells and in an autologous fashion, then transferring those to the oocyte um, and claims, claims hundreds of pregnancies, uh, but no full-length paper, so there are no details available, so unfortunately I can't share any data from him. And then what about the timing? Do you do this synchronously or asynchronously? And you look at the literature that both of those approaches have been used. 
but you can't really come to much conclusion about it. So do you do this from mature oocyte to mature oocyte? Can you do this from a zygote cytoplasm to a mature oocyte, vice versa? What would be the consequences? I really don't know very much about this, but it's obvious that most um, who are interested in this are looking at this from an, uh, a synchronous point of view. Then what's the source? Is it autologous or do you use transportation? Um, transplantation, transplant would be the right terminology for this. Okay, so. If you look at the literature, uh, you'll find literature in almost any combination, uh, but not too many of these uh, led to a lot of live births. The number of babies born in total is maybe a few hundred. And most of them come from the work of the Taiwanese group where they use cumulus cells, mitochondria. So all of these in green have given us live birth. Um, if I look at it in more detail, um, uh, on the top right, you see, um, on the top right, you see here uh, a paper by, um, uh, papers by, some papers by the um, Over Science Group, uh, Faki, and octai, and they, they have injected mitochondria that were isolated from, from uh, egg precursor cells, which I know is controversial. Um, so the isolation is controversial. Whether these cells exist or not is controversial. Whether they can be isolated and then grown, and whether the mitochondria can be retrieved, that's maybe less controversial, but of course then the injection is also in doubt. So these are quite a few experimental steps and I'm sharing this with you, not saying that, I, I, I'm not at all uh, suggesting that this is something you should do, uh, but it is of, of a certain interest, um, and that's why this data is being shared. So the synchronous work, as you can see, is where most of the papers are. Asynchronously, uh, there was a group that claims actually pretty high success rate from China, publication in 99 from Wang and co-workers, where they took um, um, multinucleated zygotes that could not be used for IVF from the same patient, and then in the next cycle use that cytoplasm in, in oocytes and in chat. So that's an asynchronous transfer, and they claimed very high success rate. Uh, uh, not too many patients, but something like five or six became pregnant out of a group of about nine. Okay. So about ooplasmic transfer, uh, or transplantation. This was done in the mid-1990s when we became interested, became interested maybe a few years earlier. And we were interested mostly in patients who had repeated implantation failure. So we were not interested in doing this for maternal age. And the reason for that was the early papers of uh, aneuploidy detection by fish, whether they were unreliable or not, and had a high error rate and a high misdiagnosis rate, it was very clear that there was a correlation between aneuploidy and maternal age. And that has never changed. And even the proponents or opponents and opponents now of PGD, PGS, will, will agree on that, that there is a high correlation with maternal age. So even though that data was very preliminary at the time, we felt it wasn't a, a good decision to do this in older patients. So we did this in patients that were 40 or younger. Uh, we did this after we did a couple of years of studies trying to master the technologies uh, that were involved, but ultimately we decided to do this by ICSI, which is of course something that we, that we were familiar with. So in the mid-90s, there were acceptable pregnancy rates, but only were achieved in the United States by multiple embryo transfer, and also by a lot of programs in the rest of the world. You had to transfer a lot of embryos, and many of you were there at the time, and the success rates were poor, even with a lot of embryos, and since it was such a chance, your rate of multiple pregnancy rate was extraordinarily high. So you had a high rate of multiple pregnancy and a low rate of pregnancy. So when you look at American data, we published this in 2012, you look at the increment in success rate per year from, from uh, 2002 to 2010, we analyzed all the data of all the clinics that reported to the SART course database and we found that implantation rate increased every year by 0.9%. It's a linear relationship. And in fact, if you draw that line back, you come out to about 1982, 
to zero. So if you draw that line forward and you go back into the 1990s, the difference between the 1990s, although that data is not available, and the 2000s and 2010s, it seems to be very clear that in, two, in, the, in the early 1990s when we were making this decision, the success rates were just so low that we were, as practitioners, we were very frustrated. So cytoplasmic failures seemed a reasonable proposition at the time, uh, but highly experimental. There was one paper um, that was based on a mouse developmental block. In the mouse, most of the people interested in experimental embryology use inbred strains. Inbred strains are achieved by mating brother sisters for at least 20 generations. That's the definition of obtaining an inbred strain. So you do that at least 20 generations. Most commercially available inbred strains that are used for experimental embryology show if you, if you look back at the, at, at, at the pedigrees, that it's hundreds of generations of inbreeding. And that's how you get a homogenous population of mice that you then can study. It makes, for modeling purposes, it makes complete sense. There are anomalies with those inbred strains, and one of them is called the two-cell block. So eggs that are fertilized in vitro or, or zygotes that are flushed from the uterus in mice, when, when they get to the two-cell, they will block. Nowadays, there are metabolic ways to get around that. In those days, this is a paper from 1988 from Hester Pratt uh, and Muckleton Harris. They showed that you could actually take the cytoplasm from a non-blocked uh, two cell and transfer that in picoliters, in very, very small amount, to the blocked ones, and then they would unblock and go through the two cell block and develop the blastocyst. So that was the first time that it was shown that uh, the, there were cytoplasmic factors that developed, that inhibited development. Um, a, a very profound paper, uh, and this was 1988. So we selected patients with multiple failed IVF, poor embryo development, but not increased maternal age. So it's not a rejuvenation process or anything like that. Some of them had poor ovarian reserve, but most of them were good responders. And, uh, and it was done by ICSI. Um, okay, so this is a picture from the first paper. What it shows is uh, this is the donor egg in panel A and B, and this is the sperm, which is uh, put at the end. It was picked up first into the donor egg, and the membrane was broken, and cytoplasm was picked up to about this point, which gives you about five to seven picoliter of cytoplasm. It wasn't always the same because it was, of course, dependent on the needle. So there were differences. And then you move to the patient egg and you inject that whole bit. Very similar to ICSI. There really is not much difference. The amount was about 5, 7, maybe sometimes 10% of the volume of the cytoplasm of the recipient egg. So it's highlighted here, uh, approximately. So one potential criticism of this work, well, this may not be enough, but remember now, the mitochondria in the egg, there are so many of them. It's at least 10,000 mitochondria that are being injected here. So it's a lot of mitochondria. Um, and, and therefore, it's also a lot of cytoplasm, because it is the cell with the highest volume of any tissue, highest volume of cytoplasm. So this is how that works. This is done with at least two witnesses because you're mixing donor X and patient X in the same environment, and you're moving this needle around. So there's a big screen up uh, with this, this video analysis and two witnesses behind the person who performed the technical procedure. Um, and then everything was videotaped. So the, limitation, the, the findings are listed here. Uh, it's a prospective pilot study, no randomization. It uh, was only done a repeated implantation failure, and the average number of previous cycles that were failed was 4.8. Only 37 attempts over a four-year period, um, because only a very small fraction of patients that were offered the procedure consented to it, uh, because they were clearly told that this was experimental, and there were m risks associated with it that were mostly unknown. Uh, we made it clear that uh, we didn't advise on medical grounds to do this, but that was an experimental procedure. 
and that internally we would take some of the acts and do actually act donation. So that was a control backup, if you like. 33 patients, so some came back a few times, 17 babies, 12 deliveries. Um, one male twin, twin, so two implantation had uh, XO. One miscarried before there was a fetal heartbeat, before there was a fetal sac. One miscarried, but um, material was obtained and was assessed as having XO. We weren't that concerned at that point because XO in early embryos is the most common anomaly. We weren't that concerned about that, but then there was a second one in a twin pregnancy at about 14 weeks. And two normally developing fetus and one had a clear XO was selectively reduced to twin the, the, the single twin sibling um, delivered normally and is doing well. So the, the, the second one really is what concerned us, but it's very hard to understand how this works. How would the injection process of external cytoplasm cause a meiotic problem? So there may be an association, but it's one that I, I, I can hardly understand. Uh, there was one male twin who was reported to us at 18 months after delivery as having been tested uh, psych for psychological testing and was um, diagnosed with pervasive developmental disorder. It was a borderline test, and then we lost contact with the patient after that. Um, it should be taken at face value. Also, that is, of course, a concern. Uh, we were very concerned about, about that, but couldn't get more information at the time. Um, it turns out that this particular boy is doing well, and that that was a misdiagnosis or some diagnosis, only 18 months old, it really is apparently very high to, to assess firmly whether a phase of developmental disorder exists or not. So right now, he's 17 years old. No, he has not, or 16 years old. He does not have uh, a developmental disorder and does very well in high school. So, some people have interpreted this wrongly and say there are anomalies associated with this technology. Well, there could be, but that could be associated with the parents, right? That's what we always say about anomalies when we see them. Is this parental origin or is it technology origin? So you can't, you can't really necessarily distinguish that. These patients had multiple failures. Why did they fail? So there could be all sorts of, of issues there. Um, <coughs> We did donor mitochondria testing in eight of the babies that were born. Uh, the others, there were 17 babies born, the others were not tested because the parents didn't give us permission. And on two of those we find, found that we could trace back the mitochondria population to the egg donor. So those, were, those had non-coding hatoplasmy with mixed haplotypes, not mutations. The follow-up data is quite reassuring. Uh, this is a paper that was published uh, last year by Serena Chen. And um, since this was so much later, um, the patients were contacted and advised by the internal review board after considerable debate, were contacted for a survey and not to bring in their children for a test. The children were older. Uh, and you could, of course, do all sorts of testing, medical testing, psychology testing. Uh, but we didn't know what the disclosure rate was. We didn't know how many of those children knew that they were from egg donation, from IVF, from egg donation, or cytoplasmic transfer. That was unknown. So the IRB told us we should do a survey study first. And that's what we have published. Um, it is obviously limited because it's survey-based. These were just questions asked to the parents. 12 of the 13 couples participated. That's a very high rate of success, at least in that respect. But it actually was the 13th couple that we were the most interested in, because they, were, they had um, um, a quadruplet born from this procedure. They had way too many embryos transferred that all looked highly fragmented and abnormal and that were transferred. Uh, and unfortunately, quadruplet resulted. Uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago, these things happened. And uh, we were mostly interested in that couple, but they, we couldn't find them. We think we did, but it turns out that we actually were on the wrong trail of finding their appropriate addresses and contact information. So the questions had uh, information about disclosure, pregnancy, birth, health, and academic performance. 
Uh, we looked at prenatal development and delivery. These were uneventful, but we knew that already. School grades were good to excellent. Two of the, two of the uh, 13 were good. All the others were excellent. Um, also need to inform you that these were children of uh, families that were doing economically better than the average. So that may be a factor. Um, BMI, 12 of 13 were normal. It's considered about average. Uh, for the United States data, of course, it's a small group. Uh, no current developmental disorders, although one girl was diagnosed with borderline attention deficit disorder. Also, that is a familiar frequency in the United States and not out of the order. Only one in 13 had a disclosure of actination, IVF, actination, and cytoplasmic transfer. That's well below what the literature reports on actination disclosure to children. It's very low. So we were really quite surprised about that, and that's really the only surprising finding of this very small limited study. So did it work? That's a question I always get. I don't know. The only data that is maybe of interest is, the, is shown here. We, we would have gone to a randomized study, even a very small one, if we could have gone through the FDA situation, and the, unfortunately that didn't happen. Um, so all I can show you is this. So what is this? These are on the horizontal axis in the first group here, the attempt types in the first bars of normal IVF ICSI patients. Okay? And you can see the second attempt, it's a significant decrease in pregnancy rate. Third attempt, again, decreases and on, so on. I mean, this is obvious and found by a lot of clinics, they find that for each attempt, there's a rate of decrease. So it is diagnostic. If you fail one cycle of IVF ICSI, your chances in the next cycle, for most clinics, not all clinics, chances in the next cycle decrease significantly. So when we did uh, cytoplasmic transfer, we ended up here. Um, so that is kind of positive. When we look at implantation rate, fetal heartbeat per embryo, it's kind of the same correlation. The last bar on the right is the bar of cytoplasmic transfer. So it's not certainly not proof, but it wasn't bad. So it's, at least it was not detrimental in terms of outcome, in terms of pregnancy rate. Um, the ma major criticism was about hetoplasmy, our findings about hetoplasmy, which was not unexpected. Um, and um, uh, most of that work involved combining two inbred species in the mouse um, and the hatoplasmic mice from these studies. And these are studies from the papers that are listed here. Uh, Acton, that was from Bob Casper's group. Uh, Liang et al. and Chang et al. Three studies, and also Sharpley et al. later, confirmed that they saw developmentally and cognitively affected um, offspring. That was not really in the way that we had done cytoplasmic transfer. It's actually all done by nuclear transplantation, and they saw transient to major effects. But it was combining two inbred species. Now, if you use F1 hybrids where you take inbreds and then cross them, development is much more easier experimentally in the embryo. No or minor effects were seen, and these are the studies from Mireas and Larry Smith in Canada, the early studies that we in part based our decisions on. And then the study by Chang et al, who compared both inbred species as well as F1 hybrids and showed that the F1 hybrids didn't give you the anomalies. What was shown in the studies, particularly done by Lang and Cheng, they looked at all sorts of micromanipulation technologies and then looked at multiple uh, generations. These studies took two, three years. Um, and they found that if you did these procedures at the GV stage. It was highly detrimental to offspring. When you did it in the egg or zygote stage, it depended on the invasiveness of the procedure. Okay, a little bit about uh, egg PC cell mitochondria. I'm sure I see half of you are asleep by now, which is what I expected. It's pretty good, actually, 50%. I'm pretty good, I'm pretty happy about, about this audience uh, because normally this is the time, time of day where people are dozing off and start, start talking and thinking about other things. So I'll move through this very quickly 
and only will take five or six minutes. Um, so here in the augment procedure, a sample of ovarian tissue is removed. Uh, they do cell sorting using an antibody, and they isolate and culture these controversial egg precursor cells. I think it's only two other groups that have confirmed that they can do this. And that took quite a few years before they could. And they have published, a lot of other groups have, have tried to do this too. Some have published, some have not, and, and cannot confirm that these cells even exist, okay? So I'm, I'm aware of that. Then they isolate the mitochondria after culture and sorting, um, and they inject the mitochondria in a very small volume together with the sperm cell, very similar to the cytoplasmic transfer procedure I showed you earlier. They do this during ICSI. The difference is this time it should be homoplasmy, and also it's an autologous, well, that means it is an autologous procedure. So there is, there is an advantage to doing it this way. Um, they've done only a prospective case series, which is disappointing. Uh, it's a commercial, over sciences, publicly traded, a commercial organization, and I think really they should have emphasized doing a, doing a, a, a small um, series and randomized. So they have not done randomization. Um, and I really have very few papers. I'm, I don't know if the papers are submitted and not being published, uh, rejected, I have no idea. Um, but, but it is not, not right, and I don't have enough uh, work um, to even base a presentation on. Uh, we don't know about these cell, uh, these act pre c cell mitochondria, what their replication mechanism is. We don't know about the mutation rate. The buffer that's being used to inject the mitochondria is unknown, or at least it's not published. This is based on extracellular ionic solution or intracellular ionic solution. There are appendices in three clinics, though. Uh, so they do have parentheses from these procedures. This is data that's about a year old um, from Bob Casper that he sh shared with me. Um, and um, young patients on the left, less than 40. Older patients on the right, more than 40, 40 or older. And if you look at the bottom data right here, you see this enormous difference. So in younger patients, this gives you a success rate of 54%. All the patients, it's only 4.3%. And I don't know if that pregnancy was ongoing, that one pregnancy that was achieved. Okay, so there's a, obviously this is not something you do in all the patients. But then you can argue you should maybe not do IVF or ICSI in all the patients. So, so that it does confirm a trend that we already knew about. One, one positive thing, it's very minor, but they did present in a poster last year work where they looked at human oocyte mitochondria and compared to still mitochondria of the human HPC cells, and they look identical. Mitochondria usually in somatic cells take this, this uh, sort of shape, are very variable depending on activity and location, um, have multiple DNA loops. This, this little guy here has a single DNA loop, which is what you see in mature human oocytes. So that's it's not much but that kind of morphological comparison is, is in interesting. Also interesting is this particular graph. This is also information I got from Bob Casper. It's more recent. If you look at the cycles before augment and compare them to augment, the blastocyst development rate apparently was significantly different and higher in the augment cycles than it was in the pre-augment cycles. Still small, uh, small numbers. In actual fact, I wasn't given I've asked for the total number of oocytes and embryos and blastocysts seen, but I, I really don't know what that number is, so it could be small numbers. Um, but that's the only positive aspect I can show you, plus the morphology of that mitochondria in the previous graph, and there is this, which is a similar analysis we did when we compared uh, the, the, the cycle to, previous, to the number of initiated cycles. So if you look here, the number of initiated, so this is the first cycle, second si attempt cycle, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and so on. And you look at augment, which is in light blue, you see that's a little bit higher compared to um, uh, large databases that were published. So these are not the same patients. These are publications in recent years where they looked at the first, second, third, fourth, fifth cycle, and so on. And then compared to augment, but these are of course different patients. 
So that's, I don't know if that's a fair comparison or not. If it was the same patients or the same clinics, the same clinics, then it would actually be more impressive. These are not from the same clinic. I've asked the company whether they could see, look at that information. Um, okay, so then finally, just two minutes, reconstitution of nuclear transplantation into donor cytoplasm. So this doing the mitochondrial replacement therapy procedure, but for the purpose of doing uh, fertility treatment and not for avoiding mitochondrial disease. Uh, I got this information from uh, um, the doctors at the Nadia Clinic in Kiev in Ukraine. Um, and they were so kind to uh, share this information. Also, they have not published. Um, I do know they have submitted an abstract. They submitted an abstract to ASHRAE this year, and that abstract was not uh, accepted. Not entirely sure why. Um, and what, this, what this group does is interesting. They do different controls. IVF, egg donation, egg donation with patient cytoplasm, the reverse of what you probably would do, and the pernuclear transfer and donor cytoplasm. So they try to do this all in one cohort of eggs. It not, doesn't always work. And, and these are the results, somewhat similar to the augment results. So in patients that were younger than 40, it worked. They had ongoing pregnancies. Two of these were born. The third one is still ongoing. And over 40, they didn't have success. But this is a very small group. Well, both, both groups are small. So they haven't done many cases, 25 cycles in total. They looked at blastocyst formation rate per zygote. The control where you did actination was high. All the others were about the same level. So you really don't learn anything from that. And it was only the experimental group um, that had uh, success after embryo transfer. Uh, there was an earlier pregnancy reported in 2003 that was finally published last year um, by John Zhang using a similar approach for nuclear transplantation in the zygote. So in conclusion, uh, we have very narrow clinical databases to support further research. It's been limited to, in our, our, our particular series, was limited to repeat implantation failure and younger patients. That was probably a lucky selection. Um, we still don't have a suitable diagnostic test for patient selection if, if, if one is interested in this approach. And I think that needs to be done first before you take this step. Uh, the first follow-up of this small group of teenagers is encouraging, but more data is needed, and we will do that. We will also try to get back those, um, because this is an ongoing disclosure situation. It's possible that because of this publication that patients, the parents of patients now will start disclosing to, to these uh, teenagers. I hope certainly that in some of that, some of them, that will, that will happen. And then we can study them uh, uh, in terms of medical evaluation. So ICSI-derived transplantation and autologous procedures like AUGMENT show some promise, but they have tremendous limitation, very difficult to interpret the data. You can't really say much about it. Um, only prospective cohort studies have been performed at the time. So this is still, in spite of it's 20 years, it's still, there's still lack of evidence and we really don't know if this works. Uh, it's hard to set up a randomized trial in repeated implantation failure, and that makes sense, right? But I think what you have to do is rather than wait three or four cycles, maybe just one cycle failure or two cycles failure will be enough to get to that threshold and say, well, you've, you've, said you've failed two cycles, here's an experimental procedure, uh, maybe you maybe want to consider that if you have permission in, in, in your um, political environment to do that. Then, of course, there are the costs. You can't charge for any of this. Um, I don't know if overscience signs charges for this. I presume they may, but I, I'm not sure. Um, and there are design issues if you want to do a randomization study, and maybe you just do it on the embryo level rather than going all the way to the penicy level. Okay, and then finally, I want to thank uh, Pavel Mazur from the Nadia Clinic for providing the data, and this is the medical director, Valerie Zukun. So yeah, I went over time a little bit. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. 
No, not, not only a little bit. I understand from Luca that we just have five minutes for discussion. Okay, thank so you, Jacques. <laughs> thank you for uh, bringing uh, clinical, uh, cl bringing embryological research and knowledge to to the clinical scenario that we need. To, we we must learn a lot on all these uh, topics. Uh, your presentation is now open for discussion. Are there questions from uh, the audience? Just one uh, clarification, the, the work from Zhang, uh, it has been a pronuclear transfer, a pronuclear uh, transfer or a spindle transfer? Because oh, in no, the so paper they mentioned uh, that there were no, some the, religious... Uh, yeah, no, I understand, I understand. I may be confusing you, but there were two cases done. One for fertility purposes, yeah. infertile patients, that's the one I presented. Yeah. And that led to a pregnancy, twin pregnancy. And, and, and the, the, the delivery went totally wrong. It's described in the paper. Yeah. Um, so that's from 2003, that case. Um, last year, that was a spindle transfer. Yeah. So that particular team now believes that with spindle transfer, they can get maybe better results yeah. in terms of development for mitochondrial replacement therapy. So that was a Lee syndrome patient. Yeah. So I didn't, I didn't show that slide. Yeah. Sorry for the confusion. So you're right. It went from nuclear transplantation 15 years ago yeah. to now uh, spindle transplant. And why, when in, in the publication they mentioned, uh, why they uh, microinject the spindle in the perivitaline space instead of uh, in, the, in the cytoplasm? I, I understood well, because I saw the pictures uh, the, the, in, in uh, their article, and they were injecting, uh, micro-injecting in the perivitaline space. Is that correct? No, no? I don't, I, no, I don't think so. No, this is standard spindle transfer. So what you do, you use membrane relaxants, and then you can fold the membrane around the spindle and, and, and pull gently and go back and forth, and then the spindle comes out intact, hopefully, yeah. intact, and... Um, um, and surrounded by minimal cytoplasm, although we call that carryover, which is how many mitochondria do you carry over from, from the mitochondrial disease patients, that's what the risk of transmitting the disease. And that was a little higher than we would, would have liked to see, it was a few percent. It should be by now, I think, what we see from the British groups, is one percent or less. So no, it's not, but it's membrane relaxation, so it's not, you can't compare it to ICSI, which is purely mechanic. This is where you use a chemical to, uh, to to change the consistency of the membrane. And you can take little bits of cytoplasm out and it comes out surrounded by a membrane. Whereas in ICSI, you break the membrane. And I mean, you take cytoplasm out, you can't reconstitute that. So I'm not sure, maybe we should look at the picture together and then we, yeah, we yeah, can go over it. Uh, more questions, please? That's one of the uh, bad mates. Yes. Uh, thank you, Jack. Uh, in all those uh, technologies, it's a bit the issue, is it the mitochondria, is it something else which you are repairing? Yeah. And I thought in the Ukraine uh, that they had one genetic defect which prohibited embryonic development. At that, So it would make sense to have such a cure, but also in your group of patients, you inject about 10,000 mitochondria, I think you said. It's about 10,000, probably about 10,000. So it's 000. quite small, and, and, and there seems to be a huge number because your heteroplasmy levels are quite low. So, so yeah. aren't you correcting something else than, than, than the mitochondria? Yeah, it's certainly possible. Yeah. Uh, it's possible that none of this had an effect. Okay? So, so in, in the same paper where we presented the two out of eight babies that were born that had, were heteroplasmic, we also looked at spare eggs that were injected. And they also came up positive as 25% heteroplasmy. So it's very low, and that was two, three days after fertilization. So, so obviously something was going on. Now those were very different assays than the assays that were done on the babies. Done on the babies, you have an enormous amount of DNA, whereas the assays done on, on the embryos in those days, it was hard to qualify and quantify what the origins were. So we thought that, that maybe we made a mistake there, and, or that we just didn't have an assay that was sensitive enough. Yeah. Is there material left from the two abortions with XO? Because if you look at the origin of the uh, lost eggs, 
it might be just a coincidence, and uh, then, yeah, at least it solves a problem which has been there for 20 years. Right. Uh, no, no material, as far as I know, is left, because it wasn't done by us. So to start, I mean, these patients come from other places, and so we have no material. It's a, it's a good point, but I, how would you explain that you can get XO at the time of the injection in the mature egg? That's something I have difficulty with understanding. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, that's a good point. But not causing, but, okay, sure. Of course, yeah. So natural, and is it an artificial effect? rather than a natural effect. You're saying it's likely a natural effect. It's still the incidence would be so high, but it could be bad luck, yeah, it could be bad luck. And uh, Jacques, your, your final slide was uh, very open mind, but not very uh, precise. Uh, we Why? would like to know your opinion on uh, considering from both perspectives, efficiency and safety. Yeah. Uh, what do you think in which direction uh, yeah. research and clinical application of this research will move in the coming years? I think it's a very narrow area of research. I think, I think I th it's not a surprise that you just don't see the papers. Okay. I, think, I think it's just not enough work that's being done. And because it's in the commercial hands because of the augment procedure, I don't think you're going to see much um, from them. They, they should have done safety studies by now, and they, don't, they haven't published them. Okay. I'm on. Th thank you, okay. Jacques.